Well, as you know, debates about gender identity of anthropomorphic figures are always among the most vivid when discussing how certain objects have to be interpreted. Some of these debates initiated at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and they may help us to understand how certain ideals of femininity and masculinity were, and in most cases still are, constructed. In this communication, I will share with you some elements of these debates developed in the framework of ancient Eastern studies in the first decades of the 20th century. More specifically, I will concentrate on the way the shape of the chest and the presence of more or less prominent breasts, widely considered as secondary sexual attributes signaling femininity, were interpreted in some scholarly debates. I will also consider the way the presence or absence of body hair, considered also as a secondary sexual attribute, but in this case signaling masculinity, was also influencing these debates. These case studies chosen to illustrate this topic are the images you can see in this slide. So first, this relief from the 13th century BCE, a Hittite relief from Hattusha, and then at the other side, a figurine, a foundation figurine, or better, a group of foundation figurines from the uh, end of the third millennium BC, uh, found at Nippur in ancient Mesopotamia. At the end of the communication, I will conclude with some thoughts about the way the two apparently contradictory, but from my point of view, clearly complementary, femininity models were operating about 100 years ago when these interpretations of the materials were first launched and discussed. Let me begin then with this uh, first case study. The first case study is about this Hittite relief. This Hittite relief uh, is now known as the King's Gate at the uh, upper side of Hattusha, the ancient uh, capital city of the Hittites, and is known as the King's Gate because this relief has been interpreted for many, many years as a king. Nowadays, because of the helmet, is interpreted as a god. But the first interpretation was not a king, not a god, but a woman, and more specifically, a warrior woman that is an Amazon. And that's the, let's say, the, the beginning of this communication. So a figure that nowadays is interpreted as a male body, anyway, god or king, but was first interpreted as a female body for some reasons. This was an article here. You have maybe the first photograph I found of this relief uh, from 1907, when it was um, unearthed by Otto Puchstein, who was the archaeologist at the time, working by the uh, Deutsche Archaeologische Institute. And here you have a picture with, this, uh, with the nephew of Otto Puchstein, this Erich Puchstein. The first one launching the hypothesis of the Amazon, so the identification of, uh, of a woman, was precisely a woman. And a woman who was uh, Isabel Francis, though, the one you have in this, in this red square there. She was teacher of art and archaeology in the American College for Girls at that time. And I think that is not by hazard that a woman working in a woman's environment was launching this hypothesis of the Amazon. Isabel Frances Dodd was launching this hypothesis uh, when she went to the, uh, to, the, to the site of Hattusha. And indeed, she was a privileged one because few people was just allowed, let's say, to go there and had the opportunity to go there. But she was living in Constantinople, so was really close one place to the other. And in 1909, it was organized uh, an expedition to the site, and she was joining this expedition. Here you can see some images of the caravan that was organized for the expedition. And you can see also an image that is interesting, because this image shows this covering and uncovering with, uh, with stones that seems that they were doing every time a group of tourists was arriving to the site to make more impressive this uh, uncovering of the relief. What do we have to say that she launched this hypothesis of the Amazon? Because she was teacher of art and archaeology, but she was not properly a scholar, let's say. So she was not in the scholarly debates herself. But we have some correspondence she was maintaining with Archibald Henry Says. I'm going to, to talk about this in a while. And we also have this National Geographic magazine article. Here you have the first page. And in this article, in 1910, she was publishing the hypothesis, as you can read, maybe you can read, here, the figure of the Amazon on the Eastern Gate. So here she was proposing this first identification. Now concentrating on this correspondence. Archibald Henry says, was a scholar uh, then working at Oxford. He was a sociologist, biblical scholar, and so on. And uh, he was an expert many people was contacting just to know what was going on with many, many matters. And at that time, Dodd was contacting uh, Says to explain that she had this hypothesis and to know if it was plausible or not. And here you have a fragment of the first letter she sent to Says. 
let me read this, uh, this excerpt for you. The relief seemed unmistakably a woman, and all the native people around called it a woman. It is a queen, perhaps, certainly a woman warrior, an Amazon. All the womanship is so delicate and fine that it is so interesting, end of quote. So here is interesting not only that she was interpreting the relief as a woman, but she says the native people, the local people, is interpreting it as a woman. But what is even more interesting is that she was sending a letter and also this great drawing. I mean, that is, that is let's say, the pearl, the gem, the hidden gem of this correspondence. Because this drawing was the one circulating in most of the papers at that time. So many people had no access to the picture, to the photograph, but had, had access to this, to this drawing. And here you can see also in really bad state of conservation the photograph you have seen in the National Geographic uh, magazine. If we have a look, if we compare this drawing with the current images of the relief. So these are the images of the original relief, let's say, now at the Museum of Ankara. You can see uh, some differences, some clear differences that are, of course, potentiating the hypothesis of the Amazon and of the woman. First of all, the legs. Maybe the legs are the most clear uh, difference. But then the most significant for us, the one I want to concentrate on, is the upper part of the body, the chest. And here you can see two important things. The first, there in the drawing, you see just one breast. We don't see the other one. So it does not mean that there is no breast, but she is not drawing the second breast. It's just hidden by the weapon. But then the image is so clear that we have two breasts and even we have this clear nipple behind the weapon. As you know, so this having one breast or two breasts, of course, reinforces the hypothesis of the Amazons. And then there is another issue that is really important. There you see a kind of t-shirt, armor, something like that, covering the body with these short sleeves. But there here you see no short sleeves. And I don't know if you can maybe appreciate in this, in this last image, but all this is body hair, covering the whole torso, but also the arms. But then, of course, body hair and breasts, let's say that in her mind were not compatible, and she had to choose, and decided to choose, of course, for breast as an important thing, <laughs> only one breast, and of course, no body hair, to emphasize the hypothesis of the woman and the Amazon. But as I told you, the, the important issue is that, well, she was proposing this, she was not in the scholarly debate, but as she was corresponding with Says, Says was the one sharing this information and launching this information to these scholar uh, circles. Says was publishing a paper in 1910, and in this paper, he's publishing almost the whole letter she sent in 1909 to him, including the drawing and the photograph. So he published everything. What happened that from that moment, what was circulating was Say's paper. Of course, he was mentioning Dot, and everyone, or some scholars, were also mentioning Dot in their articles, but they were mentioning Dot through Say's. So it was something that came with a principle of authority, let's say. It was not an unknown lady in an American college for girls launching an hypothesis, but a recognized scholar like Say's circulating this hypothesis, saying, I gave credence to this possibility. So from that moment there, we have, for example, this other article by uh, Reina, also reproducing the drawing, reproducing, in this case, the drawing thanks to the first publication by Says. So not reproducing the, the original, but reproduct, uh, just reproducting the one published before. And many scholars were saying it makes sense. So the Greek sources are mentioning Amazons at that area. It makes sense that finally we have an Amazon represented in this relief. Only one scholar, that was Otto Puchstein, was saying, well, maybe it makes no sense. Remember, he was the only one who saw the original, who saw the relief, he was the archaeologist. The other ones were relying on Say's words, on Dodd's words, drawing and photograph. And he, who was just uh, having a look on the original, said, I think that he's just a young man. Because, well, he says here in this, in this, uh, in this quotation, I am not as competent in gender issues as Miss Dodd should say, but I think that he's just a young man and that there is no full jacket armor or something like that. It's just body hair. So I don't think that the Amazon hypothesis is working that much. Let's move on now to the second case study. I will develop it um, much, short, much more shortly. But I think that it's important to see two different case studies to see that this debate was not an isolated debate. It was not something just related to this relief. 
but also to other materials. Uh, here what you have are foundation figurines from the end of the third millennium um, BC. In this case, there are foundation figurines found at Nippur, uh, a settlement in the, uh, in the southern part of ancient Mesopotamia. These foundation deposits were found a bit before uh, the relief was found. So the first ones, the first foundation deposits were found 1888, uh, 1890, and the last ones, 1950s, okay, in, in different uh, campaigns held by the University of Chicago and the University of Pennsylvania. And they were found two different kinds of figurines in these foundation deposits. One kind of figurine was the peg-shaped figurine, the one you can see here, representing the King Shulgi, one of the kings of the third dynasty of Ur. And the other ones were representing the King Urnama, the father of King Shulgi. You're going to see the, the second one at the time. Both of them uh, were just with this position, carrying this basket on the head, and uh, the shape of the, of the torso was really similar. But then the difference was these ones were appreciated, the other ones were wearing kind of scared, something like that. And some of them, in this case and in the other, were wearing also an inscription in the, uh, in the, in the upper part. At the beginning, as you can see here, the first publications of these figurines, of these Chugi figurines, were identifying them as portraits de Corbeil. So they were identifying them as female slaves carrying this basket on the head. And so here, what was used, let's say, to identify these figurines as females, was the absence of body hair, this, uh, the head completely shaven, also the fact that they were carrying this basket on the head, and uh, finally, of course, the presence of these slightly visible breasts. Okay, so all this was, uh, was taken as, as warranty for that. In the case of the other figurines, these are the other figurines, the Urnama figurines, where you can see that the shape of the upper part of the body is just the same, here you have a quotation from 1931 in one of the um, first big analyses of these foundation figurines, uh, where, uh, and I quote, Van Buren was saying, the figurine represents a woman whose head is set on a well-rounded neck. The body is slender, and she raises her arms in a graceful curve so that both hands steady the basket resting on a cushion or pad upon her shaven head. Her long fingers with carefully marked nails spread across the top of the basket, end of quote. So clear, uh, clearly here, she's highlighting everything considered as feminine, even the nails. So if you can see nails in these figurines, that's like a miracle. I, mean, I have seen the figurines really close by, and um, there are no nails, and even no delicate nails, of course. After a while, uh, this hypothesis, like in the previous case, was questioned. But in this case, after a while means 50 years, almost 50 years, a bit more than the other one. So the other one was questioned from the very beginning only by the first archaeologist, and it took about 20 years to overcome the hypothesis. In this case, it took about 50 years. And then what nowadays is agreed is that there is the king. It's a representation of the king carrying a basket on the head. But what is surprising is that was something that was also clear from the beginning for the inscription you have seen before. The inscriptions are saying, I am the king. So it's not a big confusion. I am the king, I am the builder, I am the, the one constructing this temple. It's not that strange. And it's not that the inscriptions were not translated from the very beginning. They were translated and currently really translated from the beginning and correctly translated. But then suppose that, well, even if the figurine was saying, I am the king, these breasts and carrying the basket and a slave Something like that could not be the king. Um, but here I also wanted to show you this other image. The image you see here, when I tell you from the 50s, everyone is saying is the king, it's so clear he's not a female. Here you can see a picture taken in 2014 at the Fort de la Museum in Berlin, uh, before the renovation, where you can read Kurt Tregerin. So again, identifying the figurine as a female carrying the basket. So this kind of hypothesis are overcome, but uh, resistant, let's say. To sum up, to come to the beginning, let me first summarize um, what happened here in these two case studies. What we have is a first identification of female bodies, subsequent um, identification as male bodies. Then, in the case of the Hittite relief, what is taken to say they are females are the breast, or breast in this case significant, one or two, misinterpretation of body hair, interpreted as clothing or something like that, and the warrior attitude. So, an Amazon, but nowadays, as king or god. In the case of the nipple figurines, again, the breasts, the absence of body hair, and in this case, the servile attitude. 
so a female basket carrier, but nowadays identified as a king. I think that both of them help us to understand that what was going on at the beginning of the 20th century was a certain construction of femininity with these two apparently contradictory models, two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, the exception, the Amazon, of course, this powerful woman, the warrior woman, as an exceptional woman. But then we have the rule, basket careers as ordinary survived women. So both of them are just reinforcing one, the other. Thanks for your attention.